Imagine waiting two weeks to know if you got a like or not, or a thumbs up. In the decades before the internet, people made comics, and we reached out to each other. What was it like? This is the Sequential Artists Workshop, and these are the 90s mini comics, oral history archives. Come join us as we take a longer look at those analog days when communication was a lot slower, maybe more deliberate, maybe more reckless. Who knows? It was just different. Join us as we take a look and really notice how much things have changed. Come join us on the socials. Sometimes it's Comics Workshop, sometimes it's Saw Comics. Either way, come check us out and welcome. My name is Peter Conrad and I do uh, mostly slice of life autobiographical comics. I sometimes do um, comics that are made up stories or meant to be funny or dramatic, but a lot of my work is uh, based in things that have really happened to me. Um, you might uh, have read my book, This is 2020, um, or Love, Death, and Driving. Um, you might see my comics online at Vidrio Cafe or Attempted Not Known. And Attempted Not Known is actually a series that I started back in the 90s as a zine. So back in the 90s, um, when I got started in 94 with, um, with zines specifically, I was living in Sunnyvale across the street from a copy shop called Zebra Copy. And when I went in there, um, they misquoted me a very cheap price. And so I never went anywhere else. Um, and eventually they went out of business, but I'm hoping that's unrelated. Uh, I still make comics kind of the same way that I did back then. Um, I, I used to be more likely to experiment back then with um, materials uh, and techniques than I am today. Um, but I, I still use uh, pencils and uh, brush pens and micron pens on Bristol board. Back in the day, I used to actually use real brushes and uh, steel dip pens and stuff like that. And I started using microns and brush pens when I started doing my comics on the road, uh, working from wherever. Um, and when I found acceptable brush pens, I, I didn't go back to uh, real brushes. And then let's see, how did I, how did I do my layup for print? Uh, back then, I didn't have a scanner. Scanners were still pretty expensive. So I used to scotch tape stuff or glue stick stuff onto pages. I would go into the, you know, I would use a, a copier to shrink things down to fit and then paste them up and then uh, copy them directly. And then I would go get them printed at, at Zebra Copy because um, they basically uh, gave me a deal of 35 cents uh, for copying and folding and stapling, which is like, I know that's not in the zine spirit of things. Uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go to work and make the copies for free and then take them home and staple them yourself with the, um, the long arm stapler that everybody ended up with. But I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know what a long arm stapler was. Um, I, I had no idea like how you would even get the equipment uh, to be able to do that. So, uh, and 35 cents a copy. I mean, that's pretty good. And let's see. So I would do, um, I think I would do print runs of like 25 or 50 at the start. And I think I eventually went up to 100. Um, and then I would go hand them out at, uh, at Ape, which at that time was in downtown San Jose. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've always been open to printing more after an initial print run. And, uh, some of the things that I do today don't really have a print run per se they're kind of manufactured objects like um this latest one 
a comic zine, which is shaped like a pill bottle, uh, but inside is actually a 40 page um, comic with a bunch of fun little stories in it. Um, I've made uh, at this point, a couple dozen, three or four dozen of them. And um, whether I make more of them is going to have a lot to do with, um, you know, how many people order them. I could make a couple hundred or um, we could be done. We'll see. Um, I think one of the things that influenced me to start doing slice of life comics uh, and this is going to sound so weird, but um, back in the back at that time in 1994, I was a limo driver, and as a limo driver, you have a lot of downtime where you're just like stuck someplace uh, with nothing to do, but you can't go home and you can't leave because either you have like your next um, limo pickup to do, or you're waiting for people who are having dinner at a nice restaurant or whatever. And a lot of my limo runs went up and down the peninsula of the San Francisco Bay Area between San Jose and San Francisco. And so I ended up at Lee's Comics in San Mateo. And they've closed that location since then, I think. But at the time, they had a bargain bin where the comics were like between 35 cents and 50 cents. Um, and a lot of the stuff that was in there was like Dan Klaus and Peter Bag and... Um, uh, Dennis Eichhorn and, and all these guys who were doing, oh, and uh, like, who else? Julie Doucet, like tons of people who were doing stuff that was so different from anything I'd seen before. And it was so cheap that I could just take a chance on um, just picking up a whole bunch of them. It's weird, actually a weird coincidence that I haven't thought about that I, it was costing me 35 cents a copy to make my little zine at Zebra Copy. And then it was 35 cents a copy for like, you know, all these, all these crazy, incredible alternative comics. And so I just, I bought stacks and stacks of them and read them voraciously. And I fancied myself to be the next, you know, David Lasky or whoever. Um, and of course it, you got to put in the work and I hadn't put in the work yet. So, um, it took me a while to learn about that lesson. Um, at the time, there was also this um, weird magazine called Fact Sheet 5 that was a catalog of all the zines that everybody was putting out. Um, and so I would sort of treat that like a, uh, almost like the Sears catalog. I would go in and like, highlight all the things that were vaguely interesting and circle them and stuff like that. And then um, kind of try to cut that down to a list that was within my budget. And then I would go send, you know, 20 or 50 envelopes with a, a couple of bucks in each one to all these addresses of people who were doing zines that I found in fact sheet five and about uh 30% nothing ever happened. Like, nothing ever came back in the mail, maybe even more than that. Maybe it was like half, but then the half that did come back, um, you know, I discovered a lot of interesting zines that way. And some of the people I'm still in touch with, um, Vermicious Knid and Carrie McNinch. And, um, I might've even found, uh, Delane Derry Green that way. So fact sheet five was this hugely important, um, part of zine culture in the nineties. And it, and it connected so many people. I think I might have even uh, advertised my zine in Fact Sheet 5. Um, or gotten reviewed or something, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I was online um, the other day, actually, there was a conversation that some people were having about um, Fact Sheet 5 from back in the day. And it sounded like a lot of people kept copies of Fact Sheet 5 uh, and that they still have a collection of them. And um, I didn't, I might have one somewhere, I'm not sure, but at the time I, I thought it was kind of ephemeral, like you read all the stuff and 
order what you wanted and and meet new people and get new things in the mail and then it's a magazine you throw it away and i kind of do i regret that i don't know i don't know if i would um go back and look through it a lot i i guess i'd like to see a copy today and go back and and uh, stroll down memory lane but let's see so there's a question um tell the story of how you met your closest friend or peer in comics and um i feel like uh it's hard to i mean this is going to sound like a non-answer but it's really hard to pick one uh the word peer is kind of strange because um how do you measure that like a lot of the people that i consider friends um, have had way more success either because they have better business sense or uh, had a better sense of what people wanted to read. Um, and then I, I think there are people I know who've had less success than I have. Uh, and that's, you know, from a financial perspective, but some of the people who have had less financial success, uh, I think their art is amazing. And how do you say, oh, well, you know, this person's art is equal to mine, so we're peers, or this person's success is equal to mine. So I, I realize that's a non-answer. But that said, um, I did meet a lot of people through Fact Sheet 5. I met a lot of people by going to Ape and WonderCon. Um, a lot of people that I started out as a fan of and remain a fan of are now friends of mine. Um, and I have a few friends who started out as fans of me, people that came up to my table and said, Oh, you know, this is you. I've been reading your stuff for so long. And that's uh, obviously an amazing experience. But I think the common thread of um, independent comics people, the most part is approachability. And um, the people that I'm fans of were very approachable and some of them became friends. And I kind of felt the same way. Like people who came up to me, I, I felt, like we could become friends instead of having this weird fan relationship. Tell us about the first show or con situation where there were other people doing what you did. Um, so the, <laughs> uh, the first show that I went to where there were people doing what I wanted to be doing was ape. Um, what made me laugh was that, um, when you, when you table at a show, 95% of the people, unless you're like hugely, if you're like a Kate Beaton or somebody like that, where people know who you are and they, they're in line to get a signature on your latest book. All right. That's one thing. But for, um, most of the people, uh, they'll come and walk past your table and kind of give this, this, uh, look of like, you know, trying to, trying to look without looking like they're looking and then they look at you and then they look down and then they kind of walk away. Um, <laughs> and when you table at a show, you see all these people come and do that. And then you get up to walk around and look at everybody else's stuff. And if it's somebody, you know, you'll be like, Oh, Hey, hi, you know, and everybody else, you kind of do exactly the same like walk by the table, try not to look like you're looking thing. So I think the first time that I found people who were doing what I was doing, it was, it was that it was the, my first time tabling. And I realized, Oh, this is why they're uh, doing that. Look, tell us when you felt the most connected in the community or the least connected or both. Um, I've struggled with that actually. Um, I haven't had a lot of um, free time. Uh, I've, I've worked pretty hard at my day job and, um, you know, raised a, uh, raised a kid and, um, and stuff. And uh, so I, and also I live in um, San Jose. Uh, I think that a lot of the comics stuff that's really interesting, a lot of the people who are doing interesting work are in like, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Los Angeles, um, and places like Cleveland and New York. There's not quite as much of a scene in San Jose. So I'm 
able to stay connected a little bit by just like, you know, keeping in touch with people online. But I don't like go to a lot of the drink and draws or just like hang out. Um, there are a couple of people in uh, Oakland and Berkeley that I would really like to just go hang out with. And I think they would welcome that. But I'm just not up there. And it's a big commitment for me to go up there. So I don't feel as connected as I wish I were. I wish I had more time just chilling with other artists and um, looking at each other's projects in progress and just being social with each other. Uh, I miss it. And I did feel a little bit more connected when Ape was still going on because um, it, it thrust us all into one location and then there was just huge parties and, and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we would go out to dinner, we would go to each other's tables, we would go to the isotope party. Um, and uh, that's, uh, Ape is gone. Uh, I don't know of a comparable show in my area and I, I just I haven't been able to travel for shows. So, yeah. So if I'm not connected to the community, it's probably my fault. Um, but I do wish I had a, a stronger connection. Did I ever do collaborations or jams with any of my peers in comics? Yes. Um, I, I did a collaboration with um, Dylan Williams, F.C. Brandt, and uh, Jesse Recklaw. Um, and I worked on something with Shannon Wheeler. Uh, so there have been a few times that, that I've done little collaborations and jams and things. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's interesting and challenging because you're blending your style with somebody else's style and you're kind of working with other people who have very strong personalities. How did they affect your own work? You know, um, uh, Jesse and I, as part of the aforementioned collaboration, um, he had penciled a story and I inked it. And afterwards he was like, oh, you know, I'm glad you were really careful with your inking. And I realized that what he was saying is that normally my inking wasn't very good. <laughs> and he was right. So I knew I had to... Um, work on that so it's good that kind of um, feedback through contact can really be a, a helpful force for improvement uh, tell how you traded or sold your comics you know for the longest time um, it was all at ape or uh, comics that i would send out uh, people order my comics online sometimes um, I mean, this is back in the 90s, uh, it was all about uh, direct sales. And um, I considered it to be a mechanism for social contact as much as anything else. Like, I knew I wasn't going to get rich selling zines for a dollar or two each. Um, but it would, you know, people could comment on my work and I could see their work and I could see what people were doing that was interesting. And, um, now, I mean, the 90s, the web wasn't really a thing yet, right? Um, I think a lot of us who were doing zines were aware of the web and put our uh, work up on the web in the really early days. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Selling uh, or trading or... Oh, that's the other thing. You go to uh, you go to Ape or Zinefest or whatever, and it's not all about um, purchasing. You can trade zines with people. Um, so that was a thing. I I would go as a non exhibitor in the early days, ninety four, ninety five, with a stack of zines that I had created, and then trade them for people at tables so that I didn't have to spend as much money. Which you know I understand that tables cost money and that they're there to make money, but uh, a lot of people were kind enough to trade. And so when I tabled, I was also 
um, willing to trade because I wanted to sort of pass that on. Were you ever part of a distribution collective like Puppy Toss or Spit and a Half? Part of? No. Was my work there? Yes. I think to be part of it, to consider myself part of it, I would have had to participate and uh, help them put together their catalog and send things out and keep track of stuff. And I never did that, but I, um, I did submit my work to distros. Did you feel connected to a particular store or venue that supported you? Um, briefly, there was a comic store in downtown San Jose. What was it called? I was, um, I was pretty connected to them and I did, um, I helped them put on their 24 hour comic day event one year. And I had a friend who was a DJ who showed up and DJed for 24 hours. It was ridiculous. Um, and then Space Cat was another store in San Jose that um, I used to hang out there a lot and, and was friends with those folks for, uh, for some time in the 90s. Did you actively seek out the work of others for your distro? Yeah, I didn't have a, a distro. Um, So wrap up, here we go. And I'm checking to see if the battery in my microphone is still working. What do you miss about that time? What do you not miss about that time? Tell us one more memory, smother us with anecdotes. Okay. What I miss, <laughs> what I miss about that time was, uh, you could discover things. So Fact Sheet 5 is a great example. Ape and other shows were great for that. You could just like, you could just find work that was so oddball and out there. Um, I was discovering work by going to that bargain bin at Lee's Comics in San Mateo. Uh, I was finding people like Carrie McNinch and um, uh, at shows, uh, I mean, there was just all kinds of, uh, all kinds of work out there. Um, what do I not miss about that time? I think the things I don't miss about that time were, um, things about me as much as anything else where, you know, I, I was a lot younger and I thought that there was like a, a magic switch to flip or a magic thing to discover that would uh just bring success uh and i i was really just aiming at the wrong thing like i feel very successful now because i'm doing work that i enjoy uh and that's that's the point of it and i think that i did a lot of work at the time that i didn't enjoy and you can see it in the work um so I, I wouldn't go back for that reason, but I would love to um, see a web equivalent of like a fact sheet five where, where I could discover um, unknown or unknown to me people. And I think in a way, uh, it's going to sound weird, but I think that um, Twitter has kind of been that uh, I... I've been on Twitter for a while and at, at one point a few years ago, I felt like it was all like ugly politics. And so I started unfollowing those kinds of accounts and following uh, people who draw comics, uh, people who are different from me, uh, trans people and people from different countries and um, people with different points of view, uh, especially favoring people who do some kind of art, whether it's comics or something else. And magically, my Twitter feed was like full of really interesting stuff that was fun to read, that I could learn from, links to crazy like comics and ideas and things. And in a lot of cases, um, work that, <laughs> that in some ways I felt was, was better than, than um, the stuff that I was finding in other places. Uh, but still, Twitter is Twitter. Twitter is not Fact Sheet 5, so there really isn't anything. Um, let's see. One more memory. Smother us with anecdotes. 
Um, there are so many things I can't, I can't say. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what can I say? Yeah, no. <laughs> Thanks for listening. This is the 80s, 90s pre-internet mini comics oral history archives. This is a project of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find out more about this project or about the courses we offer, the programs we offer in comics and visual literacy and graphic novels at sawcomics.org. That's S-A-W-C-O-M-I-C-S dot org. You can find out how to support this project through the donate button. You can also support us on Patreon at Saw Comics. You can find more of this on our YouTube channel or through various places where you get your podcasts. You can find archives of this at the University of Florida and at our other partner institutions. And waving at you from the past, this is Tom Hart, the director of the Sequential Artist Workshop. Thanks so much for listening.